Welcome to Town Hall. And uh, what I know is going to be a really, really amazing evening. Um, hi, I'm Pam Katie from the University Bookstore, um, Seattle's original indie bookstore since 1900. Um, we're going to ask you a favor just to sit tight in your seats if you want your book signed uh, by Mr. Russo. Um, we're going to be calling you up row by row so it doesn't get all confused. Um, so can we, we can all remain civilized. Um, uh, I think, for me, um, one of uh, Richard Russo's gifts that I so appreciate is that he writes about people who have real inner lives, uh, warts and all, but he tells it with unflinching grace and love. He, you can tell he really loves his characters. Both Nobody's Fool and Everybody's Fool features one of my all-time favorite characters, uh, Sully, maybe because he reminds me of my brother Glenn. Um, he's an irascible underachiever who you can't help but love despite his allergy to what most people consider normal responsibilities. But he has his own moral code and turns out to be one of Russo's all-time memorable heroes for me. Uh, and now here is Richard Russo to read a little bit from Everybody's Fool and uh, to answer your questions. Thank you. Can you all hear? That's the first question. Yeah, sounds good. All right. But I've managed to mess up the microphone here with it. How about now? I can keep messing with it until nobody can hear. That was a lovely introduction. Thank you. Um, Sully, um, I had no idea when, he, when I wrote him that he would land in quite the way he has over the years. Um, it's in, what, what I find most fascinating about it is that women seem to like him. <laughs> um, and I feel about, I've come to, I've come to understand, um, n not even begin to understand what women see in certain men, but, but, but what they see is invisible to most of us. To, um, <laughs> and it's deeply mysterious and wonderful um, because it's, it's not always what you would think. My, my wife um, once said a, such a curious thing to me. We were watching one of those Inspector Morse mysteries. I mean, you've all seen uh, John, John Thaw, the British detective um, series. And she, and she remarked on how sexy he was. <laughs> and I said, really? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I thought, this is obviously an idiosyncratic reaction um, because, the man, because the man was, was I mean, no one would c confuse him with George Clooney or really anyone. I, w I would have thought anyone that you might want to sleep with, but, um, <laughs> but that was my wife's opinion. And, and as we went places, I, every now and then, just, just, to, just, just to check her, her, um, <laughs> her, her assessment with, with other, other women of a certain age, and I would, I would ask that question, and invariably, she was right. I mean, all these other... All these other women really just went for this guy that you they thought that that you just wouldn't have expected, and and the same has been true uh, for Sully. And I think Sully might be a little bit more physically gifted uh, than <laughs> than Inspector than Inspector Morse, especially especially after he was played by Paul Newman. Um, so 
So I, 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 can un, I, can kind of, I can kind of understand that. But before Paul Newman ever played the, ever played the role, I, I had women um, telling me that they thought um, that, that Sully was, um, uh, was, was very sexy indeed. But the most, uh, the strangest of all of them uh, to say such a thing was my mother. Uh, <laughs> who had, of course, divorced the man that he was based on. <laughs> and what? <laughs> and what she said to me was, I just like him so much better on the page. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read a short a short, you don't need me to read to you, so I'm just going to read a short passage here, about 10 minutes or so. But since it's not from the beginning of the book, and since, um, here we go again, there we go, all right. Since it's not from the beginning of the book, I, I do have to bring you up to speed on some things, those of you who haven't dipped into the book yet. Um, so at the opening of the novel, uh, Chief of Police Douglas Raymer is attending the funeral of Judge Barton Flatt, a man who has humiliated him on any number of occasions. It's Memorial Day weekend, and North Bath is in the midst of an unseasonal heat wave with temperatures into the 90s. In Raymer's pocket is a garage door opener, a remote, the one found in his wife's car after her tragic death a year earlier. She slipped on a rug at the top of the stairs just as she was about, just as she was about to run off with another man. The identity the identity of this man is a mystery that Raymer hopes to solve by means of the remote. In town, as the funeral drags on under the broiling sun, there is an accident out at an old mill that is being converted into high-end condos. An explosion that causes one of the building's walls to collapse into the street and which can be heard all the way out to the cemetery. Feeling the ground shake, Raymer in his dress blues, passes out into the open grave and is rushed to the emergency room. And that's where we pick up the story. Okay. Wait. Wait. You fainted into the grave? Charisse's voice cracked crackled with a mixture of radio static and disbelief. Sympathy would come later, Raymer knew. Probably when she saw him, saw the damage, which, in the warped mirror on the wall opposite where he sat, bare-assed, draped in a flimsy paper johnny, was pretty damned impressive. His broken nose was swollen hideously, and both eyes were slits. He'd been told that the doctor would be in to see him shortly, but that was nearly half an hour ago. And the examination room's air conditioning was in brutal contrast to the sweltering heat outside. His head throbbed dully, but apart from that, he didn't feel too bad. Certainly not as bad as he looked. The lightheaded, elsewhere feeling that he suffered prior to losing consciousness out at Hilldale was gone now, as was the dizziness. He was tempted to just get dressed and leave. But instead of hanging up his sweaty uniform, he had made the mistake of, dra of draping it over the air conditioning unit. Putting it back on would be like donning a frigid, wet onesie. The sh he shivered at the thought. Into the grave, Charisse repeated apparently willing to concede the truth of what he was telling her, but still unable to wrap her mind around what had happened. Like, on top of the casket? <laughs> no, he explained. His honor was still above ground. Why are you in the emergency room? It was my face that broke the fall, he explained. But never mind that. Tell me again. What happened out at the mill? Because Charisse wasn't the only one having trouble processing recent events. The whole building, actually? So you, like, slumped forward and rolled into the grave? 
she said. I fainted, Cherise, okay? You know that matting they edge graves with? They say I tripped over that, but I don't really remember. Ask Gus, he saw the whole thing and would be thrilled to recount the whole shit show, Raymer knew. According to the mayor, Raymer's knees hadn't buckled or anything. Rather, he had gone down like a tree. <laughs> One minute you were standing there, and the next it was like, timber! You went into that hole like it was dug to your exact specifications. You were just gone. You know how like when you try to put a when you try to stuff a cat in a bag, there's always a, a leg sticking out. <laughs> Raymer had just blinked at him. Why would he have ever put a cat in a bag? <laughs> Was Gus confessing to having drowned kittens at some point? Why did he imagine that was an experience other people would be familiar with? <laughs> well, it wasn't like that at all, Gus insisted. You went in clean and neat. There was just the one sound you made when you hit the bottom, and then this big plume of dust. I don't think I ever saw anything like it, and I was in Korea. <laughs> Korea, where he'd spent the last seven months of the conflict, was Gus's particular touchstone. It was one of the few times that he had been out of upstate New York for an extended period, and his experience on that misbegotten peninsula, even more than his graduate work in government, was the reason he believed himself to be qualified, qualified to be the mayor of North Bath. Was it over there he had done his cat stuffing? Raymer wondered. <laughs> Charisse, he told her sternly, I want to hear about the mill, all right? Because I don't understand how that could happen. How does a whole building just fall down? Not the whole building, she said, just the north wall the one facing Lime Rock Street. The other walls are still standing, he said. How can that be? I'm just telling you what I was told. By who? Well, Miller's on the scene. Miller. Jerome's there, too. Jerome. <laughs> You're repeating everything I say, she said. Your brother Jerome, he said. Jerome worked for the Schuyler Springs, Springs PD and served as a liaison officer between the department and the college and the mayor's office, doing exactly what Raymer wasn't sure, except that he was required to be on television a lot, either attempting to explain the inexplicable or to obfuscate the perfectly clear. <laughs> it's his day off, so he stopped by the station. He's got this joke he wants to tell you. When the call came in about the mill, he figured we could use a hand. Raymer sighed. Why is he acting like this? Because lately Jerome had become increasingly solicitous about Raymer's welfare, always stopping by the station on some pretense, telling him jokes, calling him buddy. He's worried about you, Cherie said. Why? I'm worried about you. Why? Chief, she said as if the answer to this question was so obvious it needn't be voiced. His head was hurting worse now, probably because of the fall, but possibly not. His head often hurt when he talked to Charisse. <laughs> I mean, imagine, okay, she said. Please, he begged. Charisse was forever asking him to imagine this or that, usually something extremely unpleasant, like trying to put a cat in a bag or some other <laughs> Korean-type activity. Please don't, he said. Imagine you're in a great big room with 10,000 other guys. Actually, he said, I'm in a small room all by myself. And the guy in charge says, OK, show of hands, who's passed out at a funeral? <laughs> Stop, please, Raymer begged. She ignored him, of course. Sharice believed for some reason that a vivid imagination was the, was the true path to understanding. Passed out, she repeated, right into an open grave. Desist, he told her. This is a direct order I'm giving here. Yours would be the only hand in the air, Charisse noted. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Charisse. 
Make it a hundred thousand guys if you want, a million. It's still just you with his hand up, chief. Actually, I wouldn't have my hand up either, Raymer said, reluctantly giving in to her scenario. Why would I admit something like that in front of 10,000 other guys? Well, imagine if you lied, you'd be electrocuted, she said. I've got a better idea, he said. Imagine you work for me and you have to do what I say. Tell Jerome, I don't want to hear another stupid joke. Also, remind him that he has no jurisdiction in Bath. Well, I'll tell him, but you know Jerome. I do. Also his sister, two peas in a pod. And the metaphor was particularly apt in this case, as they were twins. Have Miller come pick me up at the hospital, Raymer said. Well, he's busy at the scene. Where's your own car? Out at the cemetery. Gus wouldn't let me drive. Well, I'll call Jerome then. He won't mind. Don't, he told her. Do not call Jerome. I swear to God, if he comes out here, I'll shoot him on sight. Well, then you'll have exactly zero friends, she said. <laughs> All you got now is him and me, and I won't be your friend no more if you shoot my brother, because that would be unnatural. Anymore, Raymer said. You won't be my friend anymore. Well, there you go. There you go again making fun of how I talk, she said. I'm going to add that to my list. Sharice claimed to be compiling a list of all the workplace shit he gave her. It had several distinct, if to Raymer's mind, overlapping categories of abuse. Illegal, immoral, actionable, insulting, bigoted, and just plain wrong. She hadn't showed him the list, but claimed it was growing and was pretty comprehensive. Do you have any idea how bad my head hurts right now, Sharice, he said. Well, that's why they took you to the hospital, to get, you, get yourself checked out. Stay there, why don't you? Jerome can handle things. Miller, he said. You mean Miller. Miller can handle things. It's Miller on our, play, on our payroll, not Jerome. Well, Chief, we both know Miller can't handle anything. Don't matter whose payroll he's on. <laughs> I don't care, Raymer said. Send somebody out here to get me anybody but your brother, okay? And make sure whoever it is brings that big bottle of extra strength Tylenol I keep in my desk and a Diet Coke. Come yourself if you have to. Oh, I get it. This is a test, right? Last week you chewed my ass out for leaving the, sw the switchboard to pee, and now you want to see if I've learned my lesson? Goodbye, Cherise, he said. In five minutes, I'm going to be on that bench outside the hospital, main entrance, not emergency. Somebody better be there. Head throbbing to a good beat now, Raymer slid off the examination table and wobbled over to his clothes on the air conditioner. His jockeys, no surprise, were not only still soaked with sweat, but also very, very cold. Imagine, he could almost hear Cherise say, imagine what it would feel like to pull those on, like a wet bathing suit, all nasty and cold up there in your private place. Raymer closed his eyes and pulled them on, and Cherise was right. <laughs> that was exactly how they felt. Thank you. Thank you. I am. No. Okay. Uh, uh, there we go. Hello. Um, so I have some questions here uh, that I am going to read, and hopefully you will answer. <laughs> I will try. Okay. Your books are peopled by such wonderful characters. Are there any you are especially fond of, and why? I'm fond of all of them. <laughs> um, it takes me, as you know, you've probably gathered, those of you who wait for a new Richard Russo novel to come out, it takes a while. Uh, <laughs> five to six years is about my average uh, with these things. 
And um, my feeling uh, about my characters is, I feel about them the way I feel about people in real life, which is, why spend all your time with bores if you can avoid it? And, and so with regard to my characters, I, 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 um, I, I generally choose people who, who entertain me for one reason or another. I'm going to be with them for five or six years. So, <laughs> so hopefully choose, choose people that, that um, you feel something in common with to start off with and, and you have a kind of intuition about them that by the time that by the time you get to the end of this particular book, that they will have grown on you, not that they, not that they will have lost their, their, their interest. And so with regard to, with regard to all of them, um, I, 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 I love them all, which is not to say I love them equally. Um, and my connection to them in some cases is personal and in other cases isn't. Um, and it also has nothing to do with how admirable they are as people. Um, I am, for instance, um, um, I have great affection for Mrs. Whiting in Empire Falls, despite the fact that she is, despite the fact that her behavior is pretty thoroughly abominable. I mean, she owns the town and she keeps her, her boot right on poor Miles Roby's neck throughout that entire novel. But she is the sharpest knife in that particular drawer. <laughs> um, and I took a certain pleasure in watching her play with people, including, including Miles. Um, not to say that I approve of what she does, but, but, but um, you have to remember that she herself, Mrs. Whiting, was horse traded. She was, she was, a, she was a woman uh, whose husband found somebody that he liked better than her, and throughout much of her life, she had to live with that knowledge and other knowledge as well. Um, she has her own particular crosses to bear, many of which, like most of us really, if you think about it, um, most of her crosses that she's had to bear, she's had to bear her entire life because she, like her daughter Cindy, um, um, so, much of, so much of what she's dealing with as, a, as, a, as an older or a middle-aged woman goes right back to her childhood, just like you know, just like the rest of us. So, um, I have a particular fondness in my heart for, for, Mrs., for Mrs. Whiting, um, but I am deeply personally connected to Miles um, because um, this particular book, Empire Falls, was written when um, my daughters, who are now in their 30s, were in junior high school and high school, respectively. And I was full, as a parent, as a father, I was, I was becoming aware for the first time that both of my daughters um, had grown up enough to the point where they had, where there were things going on in their lives that would, in their lives that they would never share with me. And that some, there were, there were things out there in the world that they were going to have to deal with without my help that I would not be able to protect them from. Um, and what happens at the end of Empire Falls is Miles' worst nightmare and my own worst nightmare as a father. Um, and this, the book was written in a, in a state for those five years in a state of pretty much constant parental dread, all of which, my own dread, all of which I gave to Miles. And so my connection to him is is very personal. My connection to Sully is very personal in, in this book, in the earlier book, because um, despite the fact that he took on a life of his own very early, um, he was based on my own father. And, and so, um, you know, there's, there, there's just a deep personal connection with that particular character um, in, in, in this book. And so it, 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 kind, of, it kind of runs the gamut, and, and, and occasionally, there are, there are people um, in, in my novels that I loathe viscerally. Um, but that's not to say that I don't find them fascinating. Roy Purdy in this particular book is a case in point. Every time I finished writing a scene in which Roy appeared, I felt like I needed to go in and shower. Um, you can't, but that's, you can't shower that off. You know, that, 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 um, um, but, but that's not to say I didn't, even even as I was repulsed, and, and even as I, even even as I could barely you know get through those get through those those passages, that's not 
to say that, that I didn't understand that man, um, and it's not to say that I didn't take a kind of detached pleasure from, from that understanding, as, as awful as that might seem, to, to know intimately someone, you know, so evil may be too strong a word, uh, but, but it's pretty damn close. I've never had a character that so tested, so tested my, um, uh, just my ability to understand. Um, so all of it, you know, I guess, I guess even, you know, even the Roy Purdy's of the world, I, that is, as long as they're entertaining me, that's, that's really all that I ask of them, because really that's all I, all, that's, that's all I have a right to ask of you, right? I, I, I hope to be entertained by these people in the hope that you will be as well. Uh, what would Sully say to Donald Trump <laughs> oh, over a cup of coffee? Thank you for teeing. <laughs> Thank you for teeing it up. Um, in this book, um, Sully has a Sully has a dog um, called Rub, which he has named after his after his best friend Rub. I think he would get one Rub or the other to pee on him. I don't know if he'd have anything to say. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a three-part question. Mm. Um, one. Donald Trump, I hope, is not in any of the parts. No. no okay. All right. All right. One. Uh, uh, did you like the movie Nobody's Fool? Mm -hmm. I adored it. Um, Robert Benton, the director of that movie, who also wrote the screenplay, and I have done a couple movies together since, and we're always working on something together. Um, I think if if I were, this is never going to happen, but if I were teaching. Um, in film school somewhere, you know, um, somewhere out on this coast where, where film schools um, um, are, are good. Uh, and um, well, there are some good film schools in New York too, but, but film schools are, most of the big film schools are out on, on this coast. If I were teaching uh, in, in a film program, I think you could do worse than get students to read um, Nobody's Fool and then see the movie Robert Benton made of Nobody's Fool. And you would learn in the process just about everything you would need to know about adapting um, a, a long, complicated novel into something that fits on the screen in an hour and 45 minutes. I think it's just a, it's just a masterful, masterful job. And um, it, it, I'm often asked by, by people who love the movie too, um, how, how I feel about it. And, and when I tell them I love it, they say, oh yeah, me too. And what I, liked, what I loved most about that movie was how faithful it was to the novel. Which always makes me smile because Benton cut about two thirds to three quarters <laughs> of that novel out of the movie. But you know what? People who say that are right. They're absolutely right. It is faithful to the book because it's faithful to Sully and it's faithful to the tone of the novel. Right? It's got the same flavor, it's got the same tone, it's got the same texture. And sometimes really, really good novels get made into good movies where the tone shifts in entirely. And, and sometimes you can say that you like the movie and you like the book, but you become aware really almost from the first frame how different the two things are. There, 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 there's, there's no sense of being faithful to the original source material at all. And the example that I always think of when I say that, because I think Tom Parada is just a great writer. And I think that the movie that, he was, that was made from his novel, Little Children, um, was, was a good movie. Um, but it wasn't Little Children in some ways. The plot points were all still there. But, but Tom Parada's novel was very light. It was very deft, his tone. I mean, Tom is a, if you, if you want to get, now the movie that got his, his earlier novel right in terms of tone was Election, right? The Reese, Wither, the Reese Witherspoon movie with Matthew Broderick all those years ago, for those of you who saw that and read Tom's book, that's, a, that's an almost perfect adaptation and a faithful adaptation, not because it follows the book scene by scene, but because it captures somehow visually that director captured 
Tom Parada's tone of voice, you know, um, and it's not just that he used the same dialogue, he had the same touch uh, in, in, in the movie, which I think, um, and Todd Field, is a, who, did, who, who directed Little Children, is a fine director. He did In the Bedroom and a number of, he's a, he's a really fine director. But his, but his attitude towards the material was just so different, and, and so a different work of art came out of it. What's the second part? Uh, ah, you already answered it. Okay, uh, you already answered it. You answered all of it, sir. I answered all three. Isn't that amazing? I only knew one part of the question. <laughs> you are Karnak. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, I am a writer. After several recent rejections, I have slid into the abyss of self-doubt. Have you ever doubted yourself? And if so, what did you do? I have never not doubted myself, <laughs> ever. And um, I don't know. Um, I don't know who the. I, I don't know who wrote that um, that card. Um, I can say that my heart goes out to you. Um, I can say that if it troubles you terribly, um, uh, might be a, not be a bad idea to quit writing because it's probably never going to go away. Um, the self doubt that is. Um, and I will tell you. And I will tell you a story that I think uh, will. Uh, il illuminate that, and I hope give you solace, because um, it is the only pe the only writers I know are like other people that I know who don't have self doubt. The only people I know who don't have self doubt really should. You know? <laughs> um, and and so so it so self doubt is self doubt is something that is just that just trails it just trails intelligence and um, and kindness. You know, just just like a shadow, you're not going to you're not going to get rid of it. But the story the story has to do with the great Richard Yates, um, who wrote Revolutionary Road, and to my mind, even better than Revolutionary Road, those first two books of short stories. The first one is called Eleven Kinds of Loneliness. It's just I don't think there's much better collection of short stories in the last 150 years. It's just a great, great, great work of art, and. For a time, and, and, and Yates had a pretty serious drinking problem, and, and for a time he, he taught at, at the University of Iowa Writers Workshop, and um, people knew to find him, you know, after happy hour, or around happy hour, they, they knew right where to find him. He had a couple of favored, favored um, watering holes in Iowa City, but he could usually be found pretty easily if you wanted to. And there was a student at, in, the, in the workshops, a new student, who had gone there because he wanted to study with Richard Yates. And he had read all of Yates' work and, and adored it. And he saw him one night in the bar, and Yates was sitting all by himself, alone, at the end of the dark bar. Um, and um, he'd, from the look of him, had, had been there a while. And, and this student, uh, probably in his 20s, just came up and said, Mr. Yates, I, I, I hope I'm not intruding too terribly, but I'm, I just, I'm new um, to the Iowa Writers Workshop, and, and um, I've read all of your books, and I love them. Um, I, I love them. I, th I, think, I think the world of you and your, and your work, and you're the reason I came here, and I, I just want you to know that I really, really, really want to be a writer. And Yates looked up at him and said, me too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you decide your dedication page? Who are these people after for? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this one, well, we start out with this one because it's sitting right in front of me. Um, this book is, is dedicated uh, to a writing pal of mine, um, Howard Frank Mosier. I don't know if, how many of you might know his work. If you don't, that's your assignment for tonight. Uh, when you get home, uh, get on Amazon and look him up, and then buy the book somewhere else. Um, um, yes, um, yes, that's good. That's a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, he writes these wonderful. He writes these wonderful books um, about Northern Vermont up by the Canadian border. Howard and I have been friends for a long time, and he actually gave me my first. When my first novel came out, Howard was the first professional writer to ever give me an endorsement, a blurb for my first book, Mohawk. And we've been friends for, for years. Um, and we always, 
you know, because we live in the same region, we have occasion, our, pa our, paths, our paths will cross from time to time. And, and, um, um, and over the years, since Nobody's Fool came out, Howard, for some reason, Howard just, um, he loved Sully, but even more than Sully, he loved Rub. Um, his, uh, Sully's, Sully's um, uh, poor, needy, um, intellectually challenged sidekick. Uh, and, and, uh, and, but whenever our paths would cross, Howard would ask me, um, and it was such a, such a fine compliment too, he would always ask me, what's new with Sully and Rub? Um, as if they were real people and I Skyped with them or something on the, on, on, on the weekend and, and I could tell them what was going, I could tell Howard what was going on in their lives. And, and, um, um, and I was a source of enormous disappointment to him throughout all of those years because of course I never had news of Sully and Rub. I had moved on to, to William Henry Devereaux Jr. and, and, and uh, Miles Roby and, and uh, Lucy Lynch. Uh, until one day um, someone told me a marvelous story about a guy who had promised his wife that he was going to prune a limb um, from the tree that when the wind blew, it would, it would scratch her, wake her up, scratching her, her bedroom window. And the friend never showed up. And so um, since he had been promising this for a long time, this guy decided that he really had to take care of it, even if he had to do the job himself. And so he went down into the cellar and grabbed his chainsaw and, and a length of rope. And he tied one end of the rope to the handle of the chainsaw and the other end to his belt and proceeded to climb the tree about 30 feet up and, 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 and sat on the limb that he meant to prune um, and pulled the chainsaw up, fired up the chainsaw. Now, you have to imagine, he's, he's, sitting, with his, he's sitting with his back to the trunk of the tree because he, even he wouldn't be dumb enough to sit on the limb and then saw off the limb so that he, both he and it would go. No, so he's sitting with his back to the trunk of the tree, he fires up the chainsaw, um, spreads his knees as far as he can, I imagine, and, and saws off the limb which falls, which falls to the ground. And he then unties the, 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 um, the rope from his belt, lowers the chainsaw carefully back down to the ground, drops the rope, and only then only then begins to consider his dilemma, which is, of course, that since there's no limb that he can reach up here, and he's sitting on the stump of what was the limb, um, what he would need to rotate <laughs> on that limb is now on the ground. You know, if, if it was still there, he could kind of switch, swing one limb, over, swing, swing one, leg, one leg over, but so there's nothing he can do now except sit there um, and wait for his wife to come home after work five hours, five hours later in the day. Um, well, when I was told that story, my first thought was, God, who would do such a thing? And I thought, Rub Squeers <laughs> would do such a thing. And so the next time I saw Howard, I switched the story around a little bit. Instead of his wife finding him, I thought, all right, if it's Rub, then Sully is going to find him up in the tree. And I made some other small changes um, to the scene, but I just told Howard the story as if I had been on the phone with Sully, who had told me how this had happened to our mutual friend, Rub. And in the telling, when I was, and, and Howard, of course, loved the story, and in the telling, that was the, first, that was the first time it occurred to me, actually, that I might write a sequel. I had no intention of doing that. It was the first time that it occurred to me what fun it would be to, to revisit these characters again. Um, and it also occurred to me that, that, um, that if I did go back and write another novel that Sully was, and Rub were, were a major part of, that three things would happen. Um, and this is a book that all take, takes place all over Memorial Day weekend, and it's all about memory. Uh, one of the major characters in the book, Miss Burl, has been dead for 10 years when the book opens, uh, but she's still on everybody's mind. Um, and one of the things that occurred to me was that if I did go back to North Bath one more time and talked with um, uh, and, and reacquainted myself with these characters, um, 
that I would be, in a sense, resurrecting um, Sully, the character that I had created. I would be resurrecting Paul Newman, who played him so brilliantly in, in the movie, and who I have missed, because we made three movies together, actually. Uh, and I would also have, again, the company for the next five or six years or so of my own father, whom the, whom the so this, so this was, um, and, and of course, the same thing was true of Philip Seymour Hoffman, who played, who played uh, Officer Raymer in the movie. So this was, an, this was an opportunity for me, writing a book about Memorial Day, to talk about, um, to acknowledge the memories of you know, people fictional and real who had meant a lot to me and, and who uh, had, a, had a significant role uh, in, my, uh, in my development as a writer. Uh, one of the first phone calls that I got after um, Empire Falls won the Pulitzer was from, was from Paul Newman. Um, and, and he continued, every time I had a book come out, I would always get a call from Paul. And as he got older, he had this deeper, more gravelly voice, and, and the, the phone would ring. He never said hello. Um, and the phone would ring, I'd pick it up, say hello, and he would say, hot shot. <laughs> Which was what he called people he liked, especially if they were younger than, than, he, than he was. So this was, this was, um, this was an opportunity to uh, uh, this book was an opportunity to spend some time with people that had meant a lot to me. Um, what are those other two films that you did with Paul Newman? Um, well, Empire Falls, he played, uh, right. in Empire Falls, he played Max, uh, Miles Roby's father. And we did a detective movie. Um, uh, right, after, um, right after Nobody's Fool, we did a detective movie that, that didn't do very well in the box office. I'm still very proud of it. I think it's a really good movie. Um, called Twilight, not the vampire one. Um, that was Paul Newman and Susan Sarandon and Gene, Gene Hackman, James Garner. Was it really good? Yeah, and you didn't know about it, did you? Netflix, Netflix tonight. After you look up Howard, after you look up Howard Frank Mosier, then just get on Netflix and see if if Twilight is playing for streaming. Okay. Uh, which of your characters is most like yourself? Um, which is most like myself? Well, when Bridge of Size came out, um, which is a story that pretty much cleaves right down the middle between uh, Lucy Lynch and, and his boy, boyhood friend, uh, Bobby Marconi, who later becomes a famous painter, Robert Noonan, changes his name. Um, that is a book um, about um, um, a boy who stays and a boy who leaves. Lucy, um, I don't want to call him the main character because they're both main characters, but Lucy um, is a boy who at the beginning of the novel is a grown man. He's 60 years old and he begins the book by telling, telling us, um, readers, that he, he and his wife, Sarah, are about to leave for Venice where they hope to meet their old friend, Bobby, uh, who is, who is a, a painter living there. Um, so at six, and at 60 years old, with the exception of just a very few weeks in his life, Lucy Lynch has just has has never left Thomaston, um, and he, having lived his whole life there, he he makes what he calls his rounds. Um, he owns several convenience stores in the town. But more than anything else, what he is what he's what you think about when you think about Lucy is the fact that he has basically never left this place. Noonan, on the other hand, is a boy who has left at his first opportunity and never returned. Um, and he has lived his life as an artist in the various capitals of Europe, moving from you know, um, drinking and brawling his way from one European capital to another until he, now 60, is contemplating for the first time at 60 years old returning to this upstate New York mill town. In other words, two characters who could not be more dissimilar. And what people used to, when the book came out and I was on book tour like I am for this book, people would always ask me, which one of these characters is you? Are you the boy, are you the boy that left or the boy who stayed? And my answer to them was, yes. <laughs> I, am, I, am, I am both of those characters. And both of them, and I, I didn't mean to be glib in that, 
in that response, but just almost, almost literal because in a way, um, my biographical information is much closer to, to Noonan's. You know, I, I, left, I left Gloversville, uh, New York, where I grew up. Um, I left at my very first opportunity. I didn't go all the way to Europe, but I went to Tucson, Arizona, which felt like Europe to me. Um, and, um, and with the exception of going home, you know, occasionally to work road construction with my father, um, over the vast majority of my professional career, I have, I have been home very seldom until fairly recently. I've, I've started going back more. But for a long time, I wrote these novels, of these fictional, um, fictional Gloversvilles, and I've, I've called them Mohawk and North Bath and Thomaston and Empire Falls, but they're all fictional variations of Gloversville, which makes me, in a sense, since my entire writing life has been devoted to those places, I'm also the boy who never left. Um, and so, which character is closest to me? Well, if you could somehow fuse, I guess, if you could somehow fuse Bobby and, and Lucy, um, you'd end up with you'd end up with me, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have one more. Then I have a question for you. Okay. Um, we lived in upstate New York for 30 years and love it. Return every year, but after 20 years here, we feel sorry for our friends when we leave them there. <laughs> yes. yeah. Is there any hope? For upstate New York in the next 50 years. Um, yeah, it's it's um, um, the area is blighted. It's not just Gloversville. It's 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 been an economic blight for a long time, and it, and it's strange because really that that entire corridor that runs along the Mohawk River and the and the and the Barge Canal. That used to be one of the most wealthy areas in the United States. It was you know before before the railroads. Um, um, that corridor was a corridor to the west. Almost all goods manufactured, certainly in the northeast, but really up and down the eastern seaboard, all went through the Barge Canal. And the towns that grew up um, along, along the canal from Albany, right, right straight through into Ohio and to the west, all the way to the Mississippi River, those were some of the wealthiest communities in, in, in the United States. Um, and if you go back there and you make that tour of the Rust Belt along, along the Barge Canal, you can still see vestiges of that wealth there. I mean, it's decayed now, certainly. But there are still vestiges of, of that. And of course, with the railroads and, 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 um, and, and other um, uh, uh, innovations, um, um, that corridor just became useless for, for, what, it, for what its original use was, and all of those towns decayed. And, and most of them um, that weren't involved with, that weren't completely involved with trade up and down the, the canal, uh, most of them, like Gloversville, were kind of one, in, one industry towns. And Gloversville was kind of a, um, a, a canary, I think of it now as a canary in the mine shaft, because um, um, all the glove makers, all the leather tanneries, once, once the, the, the death of those towns, the death of the leather making towns was OSHA. Um, uh, once, uh, once there were environmental laws um, um, went into effect, once you were no longer able to pollute the Hudson and pollute the, lo the, the local streams, um, all the people who were doing that, that tanning, and they were now tanning not with tree bark anymore, but with chromium, just absolutely lethal shit that they were using. Um, once it no longer became viable, once they knew they couldn't do that anymore, they all went to Indonesia and India and, and, um, and poisoned other people where, where they could. Where they could. Um, so you go through that area now and nothing else has come in in many, of those, in many of those towns and it's been this way for a long time and you're tempted to say in answer to your, your questioner's question, is, the, is, there any, is there any hope for these towns? Is there any hope for Gloversville? Is there any hope for upstate New York? Is there, because the, these regions have been economically blighted for so long and nothing has come in to fill the void. And, you're, and you would be tempted to say, no, there is no hope. But, but one of the reasons I've been going back to Gloversville more over the last few years is that um, I was asked a few years ago if I would be the, the, uh, the figurehead, um, um, a, a kind of of, of, of um, celebrity um, um, 
in charge of fundraising for the local um, library. The town has this incredibly beautiful little uh, Carnegie uh, library there. And Carnegie Library, the Carnegie Foundation always gave the land and the building, but they never gave any money for upkeep. So, so 120 years later, this, this, this library has in it the same boiler that it had in like 1903. Um, and it has slowly fallen to ruin. And, they just, and, and it was decided in the town that somehow or other, in order to renovate this, otherwise they were gonna have to tear it down. Uh, in order to renovate it, it was gonna cost about you know, anywhere from six to eight million dollars. And they asked me if I would be part of the fundraising effort. And, um, you know, I don't know who it was first said to me that the only good causes are lost causes, but it stuck. Uh, and so, I, you know, I thought, you know, all right, sure. There isn't that kind of money in Fulton County, certainly not in Gloversville. But, you know, they might be able to raise enough money for a new boiler. They might be able to raise $250,000 or a half a million uh, dollars. Um, but um, by hook, by crook, by sheer dogged determination, and believe me, I've done nothing but be a figurehead. I've gone back on a few occasions and given a few talks and, and, and been kind of a cheerleader uh, for all of this. But um, you know, some, some editorials in the New York Times about what was going on, some shifts, some, some, some congressmen willing to, to, uh, to, to make some accommodations uh, granting historical status to the, to, um, to, the, to, the, to the library by hook and by crook. Um, they have now raised um, very close to seven million dollars. And they are within a hair's breadth of being able to do everything that they need to do. And as I walk around town now, the astonishing success of this, has, you can see other, other little green shoots here and there you know, this, there's suddenly a co-op in the middle of town that, that the local farmers, instead of trying to schlep their stuff off uh, into the hinterlands or, or, or wherever, the local farmers are now, are, are now bringing their, their, um, their produce into the co-op and, 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 butchering their, and butchering their meat locally. And there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a large organic uh, movement in the area. And a, and a bike path has been has been built, connecting it to Johnstown and all the way down to all the way down to the Mohawk River. Uh, and 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 there are just these these little these little shoots of hope. And and believe me, there is a long way to go. But my sense is that there is the possibility again, the the, the possibility of some sort of future that people haven't really dared to dream in that part of the world in a very, very long time. Um, and, you know, part of the reason that I'm a comic novelist is, is that I am, I am a cautious optimist, and I, um, uh, I'm, 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 I'm still cautious uh, about this, but, you know, it seemed to me that, that we were climbing Mount Everest without Sherpas at the beginning, um, and I never dreamed we'd get to base camp, and, and here we are, you know? So I guess you never know. Till you try. Okay, my question is this. Um, if someone asked you, as I'm going to be asking you, uh, what would be your fondest piece of advice in the world to anybody? Oh my God. Um, <laughs> oh. Well, maybe it, goes back to, maybe it goes back to optimism. Um, God knows there is um, all sorts of reason to be pessimistic about all sorts of things. When we're done here, just go home and turn on the news. Um, uh, and um, since Nobody's Fool was written, um, one of the reviewers of Everybody's Fool pointed out that this book is much darker than the earlier one. Pointed out that, that um, evil is a much more palpable presence in this book than it was in Nobody's Fool. Um, and I think that that's true. And the reason that it's true is that that book was written 23 years ago. And we all of us have witnessed an awful lot in those 23 years. 
including 9-11, including the rise of ISIS, including, I think, the gradual diminishment of the American dream, and for the first time, so many young people burdened with such astonishing debt um, are looking at an America that offers them less than their parents had. And it's, and it's profound, regardless of where you are uh, on the political spectrum. We've, we've gone through, as a nation, we have, we have gone through a lot. And that's why this book is probably darker than, um, than the earlier book. That said, my own personal experience is that while pessimism, you, 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 get, you get to proclaim a certain kind of wisdom, I guess, about being right when you're pessimistic. You get to say, I told you so. You know, what kind of idiot were you for thinking that any good could come of this, whatever this is? The problem, that I, as I see it, is that just pessimism just doesn't get you anywhere. And um, so I guess, I, I, I guess my, my, my advice would be, and, I, and I, feel so, I feel so inadequate to be giving advice like this. I'm a bullshitter. I'm a storyteller. I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a guru of, of, of any, of any I'm, not, I'm not trained, really, to be giving anything, <laughs> advice about anything but storytelling. Uh, and and, and there even a certain kind of storytelling. But my, speaking to you just as, a, as one human being to another, um, uh, and, and, and watching my daughters and now my grandchildren, um, I, just, I just think that, that optimism is just healthier. Yeah, it leads to more disappointment. Of course it does. Of course, of course it does. But if you're looking for those little green shoots, you don't expect everything to get better, but, but you know, those, those little green shoots, they're, they're not nothing. They're not. They're not. And, and when, you look at, when you look at things globally, they seem to be for shit, uh, and often are for shit. But, but what's happening in your neighborhood isn't, at least not my neighborhood. And, and um, the, oppor the opportunity to make things happen at a, in the micro level, um, it may not be enough for some people. It's enough for me. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you.